Hey everyone, the name is Eric Thor and today I want to talk about INFP personality type love and dating. So what personality type should you go for if you're an INFP personality type? There are some common options. The, the three biggest common options are the ESTJ personality type or the ENTJ personality type. The INFP personality type or the ISFP personality type. And finally, the third option the ENFJ personality type or the ESFJ personality type. So these six types tend to represent common options for the INFP personality type. So you can see either we're looking for somebody that will be like us, somebody that will remind of us of who we are and will help us be ourselves, or we're looking for a partner that, like an opposite, will keep us safe, will push us, will help us get out there, will help us get things done, and will help us deal with the inferior function. Or we're looking for a relationship of the auxiliary, of somebody that will engage us and stimulate us and will get us to go out and chase our dreams and be a little bit crazy and a little bit wild and romantic. So we're either looking for a partner that will make us feel safe or a partner that will make us feel loved or a partner that will make us feel accepted. We're looking for either a person that will woo us and give us plenty of attention and inspire us or we're looking for somebody that will feel nice to come home to, that will always be there for us, that will be loyal. You know, love in the modern society is increasingly starting to be about self-love. We're starting to move from uh, the love of the love ideal of yin and yang where opposites attract to a pursuit of a shared love or a joint love, you know, uh, shared passions, shared interests, shared motivations, shared values. These things are becoming increasingly important today. So our idea of what we date and who we choose to date has become different. We're starting to move from that opposites attract idea where INFPs go for ENTJs and ENFPs go for ISTJs to a little bit more crazy dynamics such as an INFP dating an ENFJ or an INFP dating another INFP. So what you're getting out of dating different personality types, that depends, you know. What I want to believe is no person can give us everything we need. And attraction isn't everything. Attraction is what can bring about the relationship. Attraction sets a good baseline, you know, you can be attracted to somebody and that's great. And that's a good start for love. But attraction goes beyond that. And I, I mean, relationships, the ideal relationship goes much further and beyond that. I believe a relationship not only has to be attractive to us, so I, our mate does not just have to be attractive to us, but they also have to give us what we need. You know... I don't believe there's anything inherently attractive about any personality type. You're nine of peace, so what? That just says something about your interests, your values, who you are, like what you'd like to do. But it doesn't say anything about what you do. You know, when you start acting on your personality type, when you start pursuing your flow traits, when you start expressing yourself and doing something with yourself, that's when you start becoming really attractive to other people, you know? What you have to do is you have to work on your values and your virtues. The question is, am I a virtuous person? Am I a good person? Do I know myself? You know, because those things are attractive. Knowing yourself is attractive. But introspecting and thinking about who you are does not necessarily have to be attractive at all. You know, uh, being honest, that's attractive. But thinking about what to say and what there, what I believe and what's true or not, that's not attractive at all. So just having a quality or wanting to have a quality is not enough. We also have to go out and express ourselves and act on who we are and put ourselves out there. So there is a part of relationship where it's like we can meet as INFPs, we can meet ENFJs and uh, we can find free-spiritedness, the free-spiritedness of the ENFJ attractive, we can find the passion of the ENFJ attractive, we can find, uh, you can find the uh, independence of an ENFJ to be quite uh, encouraging and inspiring. But when an ENFJ is not acting on these things or is not doing this in a proper manner, that's not attractive at all. So you can't go into this box where I'm, I'm looking for an ENFJ. You have to look for an ENFJ that is willing to actually be themselves and put themselves out there. You have to meet an ENFJ as well, 
that can be vulnerable, you know. Uh, often what I feel with the mirror relationship dynamics, like uh, INFP stating ENFJs, is this relationship can be great, but if one of you is not ready to be vulnerable and to explain themselves and to put themselves in your shoes, it's not going to work. The mirror relationship can only work if we're ready to see ourselves from the other person's perspective. Otherwise, the mirror relationship has no point, no purpose. The point of the mirror relationship is to see yourself from the other person's side, is to see the other person's perspective, is to be enriched by the other person's viewpoint. And the same goes for the other personality pairings. If you date an opposite and you're not ready to trust them and to be loyal and to be connected to them and to push them, it's not going to work out. And the same goes for a same type relationship, you know, because the same type relationship is about, you know, finding yourself, it's finding who you are, it's expressing yourself, it's being yourself. Those are the core dynamics. But if you're not ready to give the other person space to do these things, it's not going to work out. So a relationship can work or fail based on how prepared we are to make it work or fail. Love is a key ingredient to love, you know. <laughs> what I mean with this is... Uh, if you love somebody and if you do feel attracted to somebody and if you do feel that uh, they are important to you and that you need them to some extent, you can also be prepared to compromise. You can also be prepared to work with them. You can also be prepared to be vulnerable towards them and to express yourself and to share and to be yourself around them. Love makes us do crazy things. You know, I moved... Uh, I was going to say across the continent, it felt like that, from Sweden to Netherlands uh, for love. And I changed a lot of my life around for love because I felt it was important enough. And before then, I went through life and I never met a girl that I felt was that important. I've, I dated a lot of people, but I never felt anybody was important enough to sacrifice anything for them. I was happy with myself, with where I was. I didn't feel I needed to do anything. So now... What I've been gravitating towards is uh, uh, just teaching love, you know, encouraging love and uh, encouraging people to let love change their life. So what I've been feeling lately is most people have fallen victim to a sort of love clock. And this love clock, it says, well, basically, when you hit your teens, maybe you start dating, but... For the most time, you're so self-involved, you're so focused on yourself, me, I, I want this, I want that, you know, that often love is no solid framework to work any in, in a long-term manner, you know. We can see our own perspective, but we can't see the other person's viewpoint. And then there is the 18-year-old uh, and beyond phase, you know, when you start looking more at careers and success, and that can make or break relationships as well, you know. You have that phase where you're looking for mastery and to get skills and study and you're so focused until almost your 30s or 40s on finding success in careers and studies that love tends to be very secondary. Love can work through these phases but it can be very difficult to maintain it. So what I feel is you get a lot of people who come in their 30s, 40s saying, oh, now I'm ready to settle down. Now I'm ready to meet the one. So basically what we're saying is we're prepared to go through life for at least 30 to 40 years, almost half our life, without a partner, without dating anybody, without committing to somebody, without feeling love, or without uh, letting ourselves feel love or be in love. What that means is we will most most of us will be realistic enough to put career choices, ambitions, and so on before love, and we're in such a rush to do these things. You know, uh, it's like uh, we believe I can compromise on love, but I can't compromise on career. If I go past thirty, it's too late to make a career. It's too late to succeed. It's too late to achieve anything in work or in other areas or aspects of life. But that's not the truth. The truth is uh, you can do these things whenever you want. You can start a career when you're 50 and be very successful at it. You can find love when you're 18 and be very happy with it. You can start a family early in life or later in life. You can choose to do it when you're 20. You can choose to do it when you're 40 if you're very, very, very lucky. Uh, so what I feel is... and uh, let me get back to the INFP relationships and dating topic for a bit. 
we have to look at our needs alongside our attractors. You know, write down the list, after this video, write down the list, what traits in a person do you find attractive? Free-spiritedness, perhaps, or speaking up what you want, or uh, justice, or... Uh, being fair to others, you know, you can write down things that you've found attractive in the past or things that you find attractive right now. And you can think about, okay, which of these things do I really find attractive and which things do I only find attractive because of the movies or because of fiction. <laughs> because often the fake attractors, uh, the real attractors can confuse us, you know, what we believe we should be attracted to does not always interconnect with what we are actually attracted to. So what you have to learn to do is find and feel attraction, actually feel attraction to another person, actually uh, let yourself feel attracted to a person when they do something. Uh, let yourself be wowed by somebody or let yourself be awed by somebody and let yourself be off put by somebody or let yourself feel disgusted by somebody if they do something bad or do something you don't like. As long as you keep that to yourself, as long as you can feel that to yourself and keep boundaries in these things, I believe that can teach you love. But the other part of it is needs, you know. And the Enneagram is the perfect mapper of needs. I believe and I love the Enneagram and I love the Big Five as well for this ability to describe kind of what we need in ourselves, in our life, in what we do and uh, what we need to feel happy and fulfilled and relaxed, you know. Needs can be shown, for example, in the two uh, types and... Uh, uh, Nine types need for harmony or a partner that is loving and reassuring. Uh, or in the eights type to need a partner that is challenging and that will argue with you and will put you on your toes, you know. Uh, different Enneagram types need different things. And the Enneagram can be an additional factor or dimension that can help explain why a relationship is so great or so terrible. And it can also explain why you're attracted to different personality types. An INFP with a strong one tendency might choose to go for an INTP personality type. And why do they do that? Why would they do that? Why would they go for an INTP or an INTJ? Well, because they are looking to improve themselves. And that need to improve yourself can attract an INTJ or an INTP. INFPs tend to be very focused on who they are and being the best version of self. And an INTJ or INTP can help with that. Why would an INFP date, say, an... Uh, ENTP, well, maybe they're quite outgoing or maybe they're looking to become quite outgoing. They want somebody that will get them out there and somebody that will push them. Somebody that will say, hey, don't be such a crybaby. Come on, go out and have fun, you know. The INFPs need different things depending on what their experiences have been, where they have grown up, what they grew up to believe, what they grew up to value and find important. So different personality types can help you on this mission. An INFP dating and uh, an INFP4, for example, might find themselves equally being attracted to, uh, for example, what would we do, what would work well here, to the four nature. I believe an INFP4 would do well with uh, an INTP or an INTJ or an, uh, maybe even an ENTP or ENTJ. And I believe an INFP2, for example, might do better with another feeling type. Because I think twos, they have this need for uh, that emotional connection beyond that competitiveness. You know, the INFP4 can be quite, quite self-absorbed and focused on, you know, their creative work. Uh, their art expressions and what they do and they want to be successful in what they do and they're very like competitive and very envious of others at times sometimes jealous so they want to be the best you know they have that drive to want to be the best in something but the INFP too they have that more emotional drive of just you know uh, putting yourself out there helping another person sacrificing yourself for another person saying being honest even if it the hurts uh, even if it hurts you and even if it means putting yourself in a bad situation at the chance of helping another person so an INFP too might need a feeler more because a feeler might provide that emotional encouragement whenever you do that it can help that it can help you feel that pride so what you need to do is look at basically your MBTI type alongside your needs. And I have a clock for this, but I can't illustrate it yet. 
uh, that will help people understand why do I like these types? Why do I draw? Why am I drawn to these types? What can it mean if I'm always attracted to this kind of guy? You know, what do, what can it mean to be attracted to this kind of girl? So. If you have any questions about this, feel free to approach me here on YouTube or on patreon.com slash Eric Dorr. And I'll be more than happy to help you uh, help understand your relationship life, your dating life, what you could work on, how to get to know your needs better, how to get to know your attractors better, how to get to know your partner's attractors or your partner's needs. Because I believe love is that uh, that dual sided thing. It's not just you, but it's also them. And it's what they want and it's what they need and it's also being able to be that kind of person to them sometimes you know if they need somebody that will be strong for them when they're upset uh, being able to be that person for them sometimes or being able to do that even if it's difficult for you sometimes just uh, show some effort just show some love just show some care and learn your partner's love languages and learn to know how they care for you and how they show love for you so I hope this video helped you as an INFP get to know yourself better. I hope you're starting to write down your list after this video. Uh, all those things you're attracted to, all those things you need in a partner, all those things you thought you needed but that you don't need from a partner, all those things you thought were attractive but were not actually that attractive. So it's uh, trial and error. Love is trial and error. Love is the most complex mathematics there are. So truly understanding it, that requires you to be very, very in tune with yourself and your own feelings. So I hope things will be alright, and I hope uh, your love and dating life is going to be all the way up from here, from now on, and that things are going to get better. Thanks for watching this video, and I hope to see you guys in the next video.